but it's far from sufficient. So I want to introduce our first speaker today. It's Dr. Josh Ginsberg, uh, a, a mentor, a friend, a colleague. We were together for many years at the Wildlife Conservation Society. I actually first met him wandering around Wangi National Park in Zimbabwe in the early 1990s. And he's now president of the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, New York. And Josh is an ecologist, a strategic thinker, and someone who really does think about how to move science to impact. Josh. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if I can get the first slide. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about Lyme disease uh, and preventing Lyme disease at the county level. This is work that's led by Rick Osfeld, who's a member of the Board of the Planetary Health Alliance, uh, and Felicia Kiesing. Um, so anything that you really like about this is the result of 25 years of, of strategic research on ticks, tick-borne disease, and what the factors, the ecological factors that drive it, uh, and how we apply that to trying to reduce the impact of, of that disease. And anything you don't like is where I misunderstood and got it wrong. Um, so uh, Lyme disease is the fastest growing zoonotic disease in, in North America. You know, in the last 15, 20 years, it has spread both geographically and even more importantly in density. Each of those is a, a dot for occurrence at the county level. And so um, what do we do about it? I think the challenge is uh, that it's increasing. There are about 300,000 cases. It's a reportable disease, but the, the, the quality of the reporting is, is not perfect. Um, there are no vaccines available. There were. They were pulled off the market. If I had more than six minutes and 52 seconds, I could tell you why. Um, but fundamentally, that's not the only problem because you've got anaplasmosis, you've got babesiosis, you've got Powassan virus. There are a number of co-infections or, or joint infections of ticks that then infect people. And so just getting a Lyme vaccine isn't going to solve the problem. Diagnosis uh, is problematic and treatment is problematic. Anyone who has had it or had a friend or a family member who's had it will know exactly what I'm talking about. And the costs are hovering around a billion dollars a year. Right? So what do we do? Right? Well, let's kill a lot of ticks. That's a good strategy. But again, the understanding of the scale and, and effort one needs to make is, is tough. Um, there have been studies, but they've been small scale. The replication has been poor, and they've had no controls. So they've been poorly scientific, as it were. So when Rick came to me and said, you know, there's somebody who wants to give me money. I don't know how much uh, to solve or at least try and solve this problem. I said, great, what it will cost? Came back a couple days later and said, $8 million. And so thanks to the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation, who gave a leadership gift of $5 million and are putting another $45 million into other tick and Lyme research, uh, we were able to, to launch this program. The goal is basically to change the management to develop a safe approach, uh, an affordable approach for killing ticks at the community level or the neighborhood scale. So the policy, this is a small p policy, is how do you get communities together to start addressing their own issues? Uh, we aptly named it the Tick Project uh, because we're out there killing ticks. I like to call it the Killing Tick Project. Um, there are two interventions. The first intervention is to put a naturally occurring fungus, MET-52, uh, into the uh, uh, gardens and around the houses where we are working. Uh, I'll talk about scale in a little bit. And what's been shown in previous studies is if you do that, uh, you kill most of the ticks. So you have a control and you have the application. Um, and there you can see up there a tick covered in fungus. It affects all three of the major life stages that uh, affect humans. Uh, and so that will help. Uh, the second thing to do is kill ticks directly on mice. Uh, why mice? Well, mice and chipmunks, and we'll see, um, are the, you know, the source of most of the transmission. Not only are there a lot more mice, uh, but there are a lot more mice that are very, very good at giving us Lyme disease. Uh, so if a tick bites a mouse it has a or that is infected, it has a 95% chance of getting Lyme disease into its uh, system. If it bites a deer, it's a 10% chance. So, so mice are really, really competent hosts and transfer the disease very well. So we uh, are going to put out boxes. In fact, we are doing that right now. The boxes have fipronil, which is the active ingredient in front line. The mice and the chipmunks run through to get bait treats and dose themselves with fipronil. Again, this has been done at the small garden, you know, single household scale, and has been shown to be effective at killing ticks. The problem is that at the small scale, you can kill ticks, but it doesn't influence Lyme incidents. So we're going to work in Dutchess County where we live. Uh, this is a map of Dutchess County with the hot spots of Lyme 
uh, number of reported cases per 100 of population uh, reported out. And this is the kinds of communities we're working, peri-urban, suburban, uh, quarter acre, half acre plots. And we're working across 24 of these communities, six replicates for each. So six of the communities will receive both treatments. Uh, six of them will get um, a true, rep, uh, true control where they get not both treatments, but there's nothing active in the treatments. And then one treatment and a, and a placebo in each of the others. Um, you know, it's really the scientific gold standard for this kind of work. All right, what are we going to measure? We're going to look at tick-borne disease, number of encounters with ticks, tick abundance and infection prevalence, and we're doing it through a, uh, both a web-based system, an app, uh, cell phone texting, but these communities in the households, and we're working directly right now with about 1,400 households and another 1,800 households that are, are as it were, part of the, the variable. Uh, the covariates include participant level within those communities because we sort of want to know when we're going to hit what I would call a herd effect. How many households have to participate to make this work? And over time, over the next five years, we hope to answer the very simple question, uh, does this uh, kill enough ticks to reduce the burden of Lyme disease in these communities? We are already starting a study on non-target effects, looking at the impact particularly of spraying that much fungus into the environment. Uh, and I'll talk about that under the policy implications. So this is really small p policy. This is how you get communities together. It's the sort of Mike Bloomberg, Carl Pope, climate of hope uh, metaphor. How do we get local communities to make change? Um, well, the first thing is understanding the dynamics at this scale, right? And to do that, we have to look at all these things and then report back in a way that people understand them. Then we have to build guidelines for communities who want to adopt this process once we figure out if it works. There's the big P policy piece of this, addressing some of the big questions in, in conservation and management. What are the effects of landscape level fragmentation on these issues? Uh, what are the impacts of predators? I'm a predator biologist, so I care deeply about this. But what are the top-down impacts if, if we bring in predators that eat coyotes? Would that increase foxes? Does that re you know, then uh, reduce mice and so on and so forth? Um, there's an issue this month in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society on uh, the dilution effect, uh, and it's uh, something we can argue about, but not in the minute I have left. Uh, and then also the non-target impacts of this kind of large-scale or small-scale but large-scale at the community-level intervention, spraying something out in the environment. We've been doing our own controlled studies on our 2,000-acre research property. Good news is after a year, we're not seeing uh, any measurable uh, non-target impacts of MET-52. It seems to be focused on ticks and ticks alone. We are not, at the moment, studying the impact of taking so many ticks out of the environment. So that's what we're doing. Uh, the Cary Institute, for those who don't know it, we're, we're sort of, this is the local side of it. We, we work around the world on these environmental issues. And it's just a pleasure to be able to address this question. I like to say this is going to do one of two things. If we show you can control ticks and tick-borne disease at the local scale, I think that will be a phenomenal step forward because there are a lot of people out there telling you that they can come and spray your garden and get rid of your ticks. They don't tell you it won't get rid of your Lyme disease. If we discover after spending $8 million in five years and working with, with a couple thousand households that this doesn't work, then at least we know we have to try and find other solutions at the local and the national level for this problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh.